go. It is the 8th of April, and we are here at the Clopepe Vineyards. My name is Wes Hagen. I'm the vineyard manager and winemaker here at Clopepe Vineyards and Estate Wines in the Santa Rita Hills, Santa Barbara County. Uh, it's really windy outside, probably one of the windiest days we've had since yesterday. And uh, so we've decided to sort of come inside so you won't have to hear the whoosh, whoosh, whoosh uh, in the uh, microphone. So uh, on Mondays, I answer questions via Facebook, and we got a couple questions this week, and I'm also going to give a short little vineyard and vintage update. Uh, out there in the vineyard, I uh, probably can't see from here, but uh, we've got about two to three inches of, uh, of growth in the vineyard. And uh, just had a, another vineyard manager from Hall Wines come out from Napa today. And we took a walk through the vines and everything's looking great. Uh, for the first two nights, tonight the 8th and the night of the 9th, we are expecting some very cold temperatures. So we got the frost alarm ready to go. The fans are all gassed up. We checked sprinklers, so if it gets cold tonight, the frost alarm will call me uh, through this little phone right here that's part of the frost alarm and I will wake up and go out and turn on all the machines and hope for the best so that's sort of what we're planning on tonight other than that we're gonna do some suckering which means we're gonna take off some of the small little basil shoots uh, shoots that are growing out of places that aren't gonna really grow any fruit or do us any good we don't want those shoots on the vines because they're basically a sink for nutrients and we're gonna start spraying uh, we'll probably spray some uh, copper um, which is elemental and is also uh, organic and it'll uh, help us a little bit with frost and it'll definitely help uh, slow the vines uh, down uh, um, as far as the production of botrytis or any type of fungal disease. Uh, copper seems to work really well. So that's sort of what's happening in the vineyard on April 8th and I'll try to give a little vineyard update each week so you guys can kind of follow the 2013 vintage from the very beginning. Our first question was actually from um, uh, someone who asked me uh, what, the, what is the biggest problem in tasting wine? And I, I thought about this and then I had to go to one of my favorite wine people, Emile Peynaud. And Emile, you've probably heard me say this before if you spent any time around me, but he said the fundamental problem of tasting wine is that I put one wine in front of you, you taste it, you smell it, you take, excuse me, you taste it, and you ask yourself, do I like this wine? That's the fundamental question. But when I put two wines in front of you, the fundamental question changes. And then the fundamental question becomes, which of these wines do I prefer? And this is really uh, pretty important to understanding how wine works. Because if you're, you've got ten wines in front of you, you're going to judge them differently. As if you have one wine, and that one wine is your sole uh, sort of focus over an hour at a meal. So I always say for a wine to really become, it needs you know an hour at table, delicious things, and two people in love. Take any of those things away, I think you lose a little bit of the wine. And uh, that not that sort of suggesting that wine is not objective? Hell yes, I don't believe wine is objective. And that's one thing about it. It's one of the last things we can be politically, correct about, uh, politically incorrect about. We can stand up and say, I love wines from Israel, but I, I hate wines from Lebanon. And there's nothing political about it. It's just a matter of taste. You know, you may love Napa Cabernet, you may hate Napa Cabernet. And you can say that. And, uh, you know, uh, ideas and wines do not have rights, only, uh, only people. So uh, that's, I think, an interesting idea that uh, taste one wine, you ask yourself if you like it, two wines, which you prefer, and really think about the, sort of the dichotomy between the two because I think that really, really is important. A uh, question from Steve Lemley. With Pinot being so delicate, how do you control and man manipulate the amount of dissolved oxygen in your wines? Is it something you monitor con consistently or only a few times throughout a barrel's life? What's a healthy level for a finished Pinot Noir? Well, dissolved, dissolved oxygen is pretty important because the more dissolved oxygen in a wine, the more aroma is going to come out. In fact, uh, sort of uh, Michel Roland, who is one of the highest paid wine consultants in the world, bubbles oxygen through the wine to increase the level of dissolved oxygen before those young, easy to drink wines go to market. With all that dissolved oxygen, the wines are very forward, very delicious. The problem with that much dissolved oxygen, the wine's going to start uh, oxidizing quite quickly and eventually won't get, it's not going to have the same shelf life or it won't be able to age three, five, seven years. A couple years down the line, that dissolved oxygen is going to probably actually be, uh, be a problem. Um, dissolved oxygen is something that I've only recently kind of come into uh, understanding in my uh, discussions actually with Arcadian winemaker Joe Davis, who uh, helped me understand that uh, dissolved oxygen is really important and low dissolved oxygen is really important when you put a wine into bottle. So when we put wine in a bottle, we do test it and we bubble a uh, inert gas through the wine while it's in tank. So we bubble all this uh, nitrogen or all this uh, argon through the wine and that actually reduces the amount of uh, dissolved oxygen in solution. So we like half a part per million or less in our finished wines and that'll really help them age. 
So uh, we're hoping that uh, age, uh, the low dissolved oxygen allows these wine to age five, 10 years. Uh, and I, I think that's a very important thing to do. Not a lot of winemakers worry about dissolved oxygen, but now it's another tool and it's science and it's a, a part of science that's not gonna get in the way of me believing that wine is still poetry and wine is made sort of organoplectically, which means when I smell, when I see, that's how I uh, am a winemaker. But once in a while, it's good to test these things and know right where they are, like pH and alcohol. So dissolved oxygen is a great tool. Thanks for the question. Kind of geeky. I hope you guys learned something. Uh, just two more questions today. Uh, the next one is from Landon Rust. I always can count on Landon for a good question. As a winemaker and grower, do you feel pressure to meet consumer taste and flavor demands in wine? Example, making a big, bold butter balm of a Chardonnay. That's hard to say five times fast. Big, bold butter balm of a Chardonnay versus something more complex and refined. Or do you make the best wine you can uh, with the fruit you grow without pressure to meet the market trends? Trends are part of who we are as Americans. I mean, um, the way I look at trends is Americans love things that are obvious. They love big, buttery Chardonnays. They love big, bold Cabernets. They love coffee that's burnt. Uh, they like... Um, you know, they like uh, beer that's full of hops. So obvious flavors are very, uh, are very important to Americans. Fortunately, at the price point that we're dealing with, most of the wine uh, drinkers are extraordinarily sophisticated. So they know that uh, overripeness and too much butter, uh, too much oaky flavor in a wine is a trope and it gets us away from the flavors of vintage. So uh, I am influenced by market trends. I'm influenced by the wines I drink, which are influenced by market trends. Um, I say that my wines do sort of go back and forth between a little bolder style and a little leaner style, but that's usually vintage dependent. But I am a little more willing recently to allow wines to get a little riper than I used to. That I don't think uh, anything, you know, 25 bricks is not, uh, anything over 25 bricks is not a nightmare like I used to think. That there's ways of making really balanced wines. And I just drank a wine from 2004 today, 2000, it was uh, 2004 Loring Club Happy, nine years old, 15.3 alcohol. It was beautiful. And it kind of tripped me out because it was under a screw cap, it was picked pretty ripe, and it still really held together beautifully. Good acidity and a wonderful wine. Okay, we're down to, uh, let's see if I answered all that. Um, consumer taste and flavor demands. Um, you know, I think the intensity in the Santa Rita Hills is such that I really don't have to worry too much about flavor intensity. Uh, oak treatment, I'm always uh, concerned really about uh, putting enough oak to give it like the seasoning, like a little salt on a prime steak, but uh, not so much that it takes away from the sense of vintage and the, and the place uh, where it was grown, which is Club Happy in Santa Rita Hills. So I hope that answers your question. And thanks again for a very thoughtful question, Landon. And then Jack Hicks. I love this. He uses the word scientifically. Probably not always a good idea to use the word scientifically in a question you ask me. Wes Hagen, can you scientifically explain the beautiful light cherry taste specifically found in Pinot Noir and your philosophy on the use of mega red concentrate as well as an estimate of its prevalence? Well, there are these concentrates that people put in wines that beef up the flavor, and we talked a little bit about that last week, so I don't want to get into too much, but mega purple, those type of things. Uh, probably in cheaper wines are very common, more expensive wines far more rare. Um, and then the other question, of course, where does that light cherry taste come from? Well, I, I had to actually look it up because I am a little bit more on the poetic side of winemaking. And it seems like uh, you have two options. Uh, the cherry flavor in Pinot Noir can come from a natural ester expression of the fermentation, which means the fermentation happens and it produces a fruit aroma and an ester that's very similar to cherries. Also, uh, small amounts of a chemical called uh, benzaldehyde are produced during fermentation. And benzaldehyde are, are actually used uh, in the formation of uh, the aroma of uh, almonds and artificial cherry flavoring. So when you smell cherry in a wine, you may be smelling these benzaldehydes or you may be smelling the natural esters produced in fermentation. But that's about as scientific as I normally get about this stuff. Pinot Noir, because it's a light-bodied red wine, you're going to find that the fermentation aromas and esters are generally on the lighter side of the red fruit scale, so cherry, raspberry. Um, sometimes in big Santa Rita Hills wines, you may pick up a little blackberry, blueberry, and raspberry, especially in uh, darker, richer vintages like 2010, or in very young wines like 2009. So light cherry aroma, it's really part of what uh, Clopepi Pinot Noir smells and tastes like about three to five years in the bottle. We tend to start with a lot of uh, kind of red berry fruit, and then the cherry starts coming out in about, uh, sometimes about 18 months, up to about three to five years. Uh, and that's sort of how it progresses from those berry, berry flavors into the cherry. So cherry is something that starts showing a little age in Clos Pepe Pinot Noir. Well, thanks again for your questions. Send them in via, you know, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, at Wes Hagen. Uh, and I really enjoy uh, talking to you guys about all this stuff. So ask me some questions in the next few weeks. I'll take you out to the vineyard and we'll take a couple look at some stuff too. So thanks again. Thanks for listening. Hope you learned something. Stay in touch. Bye.